I really want you to succeed in your home builds, whether you're working with a builder or a carpenter, or whether you're doing some or all of it yourself. But let's talk about timber and carpentry work since it's most likely going to be the trade you're most involved in for all your home improvement projects. I'm going to share with you the most common carpentry and joinery mistakes I see, not just by DIYers and self-builders, but also by experienced builders that should know better. I've learned the hard way so you don't have to. I've either made these same mistakes and shortcuts myself or seen supposedly experienced tradesmen doing them. Don't allow yourself to be swayed by the, the nothing argument that I've been doing it this way for years and I've never had a problem. Avoiding that constant temptation to take shortcut after shortcut, which I call death by a thousand cuts in a building project. When I snag some jobs and I see carelessness on site, silly penny pinching, well, I can see the loss of value and the false economy, lack of long-term thinking. You saved £100, $100, but it cost you way more in lost future value. Let's start with some really basic ones. These will make no difference to the structure, but will warn me that if you're making these trivial shortcuts, you're almost certainly going to be repeating that. Similar bigger mistakes throughout. Let's start with timber frame. You've got your suspended floor and place the insulation between the floor joists. It's time to put up your walls. Building your wall frames off a chipboard floor rather than directly off structure because it's easier to work off. You never ever use chipboard for anything structural where you've got compression coming down on it. For goodness sake, get some old OSB boards to walk down on and take them up at the end of the day. Chipboard has tiny air pockets in it, has a maximum loading designed to take a standard live load, that's people walking on the floor to you and me, a very light dead load and that's furniture to you and me, not roof and not wall loads. It's definitely not designed to take point loads such as wall studs which are in turn supporting a roof. Chipboard is full of air and pulp which can just compress Wash still like plasticine if it gets wet. For example, you might, one of the builders might have spilt a flask of coffee or something might have rained and caught on the chipboard. A variety of things can make the chipboard wet, which makes it even worse and you'll get settlement and cracking. Just do it right. Build your sole place first, or if you're using panels or frames, you have to build these wall structures directly off the joist structure and not onto the chipboard. And the excuse I hear is I've been doing this time and time again and I've never had a problem. I just think that that is the worst excuse in the world. Do not use chipboard when you're putting structure on top of it. Stop it short. Let's talk timber floors. Not having 50 to 150 millimeter gap below the floor to create the required solemn for a suspended floor equals condensation, rising damp, mold in the corners of your finished room, humidity issues, and if you're working with the height restriction of permitted development, you factor in that air gap for your height makeups. Don't succumb to the temptation to shortcut it. You need to get that ventilated void under your building. Link to that, not ventilating the solum for a timber floor. I've made a whole video about that, but as recently as last year, I had to get some vents retrospectively installed on a solum we built for a new house. I had even bought the vents and delivered them to site for these guys. We weren't doing the brickwork on it. They either forgot or they just didn't think that they were necessary. I couldn't get them to come back and they said, it wasn't needed and it was totally over the top and they were experienced from the bricklayers. And side note, that's why you always keep money back for each phase of the build. For a house extension or timber frame outbuilding, not sealing the solemn with a DPM and a little weak mix concrete. If the building inspector comes to your job, sees the solemn through the floor joists with no blinding concrete, you'll just have to pull up all your joists and do it. The regulations say you need that membrane and blinding layer. Yes, it's a pain, but yes, you need to do it. Not ventilating the cavity for your timber cladding, be it cedar or hardy board. You either need gaps at the top and the bottom, preferably with insect mesh, which is my preferred solution, or you'll need these slot vents. You need to get all that residual cavity moisture build up to evaporate, so you need to create that air movement with the vents. You're likely to get cavity moisture build up through wind blowing mo moisture at the top running down, or the breather membrane doing what it does, breathing out the vapour, 
which will then condense in the cold air. For these cedar or larch boards, these are just going to especially suffer, and it's a gradual creeping thing, so you don't see the problem. And related to this, we'll be getting rot within the cavity battens themselves. If you're using vertical cladding, you need battens on counter battens. Otherwise, that cavity moisture I mentioned is going to get stuck where the horizontal battens are fixed to the breather membrane and the OSB. The amount of YouTube videos I've seen of supposedly experienced tradesmen not using counter battens for the rain screen battens. I've also seen the same problems for roofing tiles with the use an OSB or roofing deck, which is even worse because you're going to have even more likelihood of a moisture ingress. It's a tiny additional amount of work to do it right and a tiny amount of additional expenditures. Just do it right. Not allowing movement for your sheet material. This problem only comes to light months or sometimes years later because buildings shrink and expand as they get exposed to heat and to humidity and then the cold back and forward over the changing seasons. Not just from the outside weather but from the way that you heat your house in the changing seasons. Your builder needs to understand that phenomenon and how different materials perform. Tolerances and gaps for all materials differ too many to mention here, but it will manifest itself in your finishes, cracks in your plaster, flooring buckling up, windows and doors not working right. Ask the question, listen to the answers you get. It's a judgment about their experience, and that's the best advice I can give you. Make sure that you leave movement joints and gaps in your sheets, and make sure that your builder has that in hand. Now, timber frame again, and the top rail not doubled up. And I mean, these things cost nothing. Loadings need to take account of nine inches of snow. Often roof joists are in different centers than wall studs. And so you get different point loading. And of course, it only, the snow only happens once in every 10 years. But how long do you want your building to last? Doubling up the top rail has come about through literally centuries of timber frame stick construction evolution by master builders. Trial and error, and the rules are there for a reason. So put it in. Now, who needs holding down straps for your rafters and for your roof joists? That roof is heavy enough and there's all these nails and screws in it. And this chestnut is so old, I've given up arguing about it with builders. This is why you always hold money back on a job. If a builder can't show me photos of holding down straps, and I didn't see them going in with my own eyes and it's time to pull off the plaster to see if they really are there. Sometimes, sadly, they're not. Sure, the storm only comes along every 15 years. That is a super crazy storm. But how long are you intending to live in that house? 40 years, I'd guess. When that storm wind gets up, it's nothing to do with the speed of the wind. It's about pressure differentials in the air. And the forces can be so great for just a few sections. That vacuum that they create can and will peel a two-ton monopitch extension roof off like it was a rug sitting on a lawn. Shearing those screws like they're brittle candy bars. And good luck with your insurance claim. Now, warm roof using a plywood or OSB deck over the insulation. This is a weird thing unique to the UK. Single ply fully bonded systems such as this are designed to be bonded directly onto the insulation. And sticking a layer of composite sheeting with a load of impermeable glue is just going to increase the likelihood of the dew point being within the timber and your roof deck will eventually fail and with it the membrane bonded to it as you get some interstitial condensation. And following on from the warm roof, doing timber frame walls and not preventing cold bridging. Just 30mm of insulation will prevent almost all cold bridging. 50mm will do it even for those harshest deep winter nights. Thermal bridging through the timbers is bad all year round. In summer, you'll find these interiors will become unbearably warm as the heat radiates in through the uninsulated timbers and builds up the temperature. And that's before we consider the additional solar gain through the glazing you're probably going to have. Scrimping on PIR insulation is a complete false economy. So for the additional cost, please think about doing it. 
pursuing excellence on your biggest financial investment and the place that shelters you. Understand these rules are a certain way for a very good reason and you won't always manage it because you can't know everything. I'm constantly learning new things but it's unforgivable to knowingly take these shortcuts. Loving the process rather than the result is what will give you the satisfaction of knowing your home builds will last a lifetime both structurally and environmentally. Hope that was helpful. I'll see you in the next one.